A reading from the book of the prophet Micah. Woe to those who plan, to plan iniquity and work out evil on their couches. In the morning light, they accomplish it. When it lies within their power, they covet fields and seize them, houses and they take them. They cheat an owner of his house, a man of his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am planning against this race an evil, from which you shall not withdraw your necks, nor shall you walk with your head high, for it will be a time of evil. On that day a satire shall be sung over you, and there shall be a plaintive chant. Our ruin is complete. Our fields are portioned out among our captors. The fields of my people are measured out, and no one can get them back. Thus you shall have no one to mark out boundaries by lot in the assembly of the Lord. Verbum Domini.
Dominus Fobiscum. Et cum spiritu tuo. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Mateum. Gloria tibi Domine. The Pharisees went out and took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. When Jesus realized this, he withdrew from that place. Many people followed him, and he cured them all, but he warned them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom I delight. I shall place my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not contend or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. Verbum Domini, last be Christe. My name is Father Dan Patti. I'm a TOR Franciscan from. Franciscan University of Steubenville, where I'm chair of the Department of Theology uh, at that university, and I'm here this weekend with the Southern Walk of Crossroads Pro-Life Ministry. We're walking from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. to join three other walks for a pro-life rally on the front lawn of the Capitol. And I think it's appropriate today that we celebrate the saint that we are celebrating, St. Lawrence of Brindisi, who was the great saint of the post-Reformation church. He was someone who walked across all of Europe preaching the message of good news and preaching the gospel and laying down his life to help many Catholics uh, gain a foothold once again and to strengthen the faith which had been so seriously challenged during the Reformation and which the Council of Trent had sought to respond to. We in our day and age are very much in similar circumstances as St. Lawrence of Brindisi was. Uh, we have now gone through a period of gone, um, completing the Second Vatican Council. We had 26 years of the papacy of blessed Pope John Paul the Great, whose whole pontificate was aimed at attempting to implement this great council. And we have young apostles of all ages, the young at heart, elderly, and the young also in body and spirit, younger people stepping up and going out and proclaiming the good news. And I think that's really what we're all about in this post-Vatican II period, this time of implementing this great council as St. Lawrence was about in implementing the Council of Trent in seeking to get out the good news. He laid down his life. He gave his whole life to the proclamation of the good news. And so also, I have found in my own service at Franciscan University and now on Crossroads, there are young people stepping up and giving their lives, laying their lives down, just as St. Lawrence did, and beginning to learn that the pro-life movement is much more than going to an abortion center on Saturday morning, but it's a way of life, as Pope John Paul II also taught us. It's the gospel of life, and this is not optional for us in our day and age. Lawrence, St. Lawrence preached the good news when it was convenient and when it was inconvenient, and he took on the hardships of the road, and I can honestly say in my being with the Southern Walk of Crossroads, I have observed 18, 19, 20-year-olds laying it down every day, getting up in the morning, 
uh, and stepping it out as Lawrence did, laying down their lives to put out the message of the value and the dignity of human life. Because that is what's threatened in our day and age. All of life, and especially life that has weakened, life that is vulnerable in the womb, the elderly, the mentally handicapped, the physically handicapped, the people who are forgotten, the people who are abandoned, the people who are left behind, the people that cannot keep up, they also have dignity. And as we read in today's gospel, Jesus did not come with a might that rolled over these people. No, these were the very people he came to say we need to be taken care of. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory, which he did upon the cross, bringing justice, right relationship with God into full view for all of us and to really begin to tell us how much we mean to our Father in heaven. Not because the government says so, not because we're useful, not because we have earning power in the culture or perhaps some other means of status that is given us by our accomplishments. No, we have value, worth, and dignity given us by God himself. This is the message of good news that Jesus came to give. And that the very ones oftentimes that we forget, the very ones that we oftentimes don't pay much attention to, be they in the womb, elderly, and everything in between, those are the very ones to whom the kingdom belongs. And that we want to witness to their value as well and speak for them. And I'm with a group of young people this summer that are doing just that. And young people I find across this country are becoming mobilized, as Pope John Paul II promised they would. This particular group in Crossroads was in direct response to Pope John Paul II's challenge at World Youth Day in 1993, where he said to the young people, do not be afraid to go out into the highways and into the byways to witness to Christ as did the apostles in the early church. St. Lawrence of Brindisi took on the road and began to preach and witness and testify. And a group of university students in 1995 themselves took to the road and have been doing so ever since, laying it down one step at a time. And I think we can all learn from Pope John Paul II our place within this pro-life culture that we are attempting to uh, infuse into an otherwise um, culture that is slipping away and dying. We want to begin to introduce the gift, the value, the dignity, and to remind people of that. Because that really is our struggle today. The gospel of life is the gospel, and that gospel is not optional, see? And it's even life-giving when we begin to live it and practice it. One of the things I'd like to conclude with is something that has been so, was so startling to me when Pope Benedict XVI became our Pope at the homily within the ceremony in the Mass uh, where that occurred. He was speaking a beautiful litany of gratitude to his predecessor, whom he had worked with so closely over the years. And in this litany of thanksgiving and gratitude to Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict XVI at one point said something I found rather startling. He said, I want to thank you for leaving me with a young church. And I thought, wow, that's startling. A young church. And yet, in thinking about it more over the years since I heard that startling statement within that litany of thanksgiving, that is, in fact, what Pope John Paul II has done in beginning World Youth Days, for example, mobilizing hundreds of thousands and millions of young people to begin to go out and witness and lay down their lives in their marriages, in their commitments, 
in their hopes for the future and a better life than what the culture currently is offering them. They're not just the future, but they're currently in the church along with all of us. And they have a message of great news and renaissance and renewal and hope that they desire to share with us. And I would just say that they are laying it down one step at a time. And yesterday, we had one of our walkers on the central walk even give his life. For the first time in the history of Crossroads, we lost one of our walkers who was hit by a car. And we're reminded that the battle for life is to the death, as the sight of any crucifix will teach us, because love is to the death. Jesus realized this. Peter briefly forgot it at Caesarea Philippi, saying, Lord, you can't go up to Jerusalem. They're going to kill you up there. Jesus understood the price. And we know what he said to Peter. And Peter himself learned that message, as did St. Lawrence of Brindisi, as did Andrew. Andrew Moore, a 20-year-old, who gave his life, trying to help the people that maybe have wicks that were smoldering, people who were bruised, forgotten in the womb, forgotten among the elderly. He was trying to stand up for them, and in fact, even died praying the rosary. We want to thank God for great saints like St. Lawrence, but we also want to recognize they are not just a thing of the past. No, there is some very real cause for hope among us all. 26 years of blessed Pope John Paul the Great have not gone away with his death. They've only just begun. And they're beginning to take place in the hearts and minds of so many Catholics across the Catholic world. And we just thank God today that he's the one leading the charge for life. And we realize that moments like with Andrew and even the life of all the saints and martyrs, that this is a battle for life that is to the death because love is to the death. And Jesus Christ teaches us that May we learn from these great saints of our tradition that we too are part of this great symphony favoring life and contributing to the good and the dignity of human life.